box fuzzing as Markov chain. And it's one of these nice papers that extend a AFL in different areas, and I'm very excited about this, uh, this talk. Should be fine. Yeah, thanks, Matthias, for the introduction. Um, my name is Marcel Böhme. Um, I will talk about coverage based gray box fuzzing as a Markov chain. And this is joint work with um, Tuan Pham and Abhik Rajhadri at the National University of Singapore. Um, let's start with a bit of a, f uh, with a the fun part of, of our research. Um, if there's one takeaway message, is it is that we took the state of the art in fuzzing and made it 10 times faster. Of course, uh, that, that was at the time of writing, so just the day after we released our tool, the developer of AFL took, uh, took uh, some of our ideas and implemented it. And he called his version a fidgety AFL, and uh, it was so in the context of our paper, we found nine vulnerabilities um, in uh, binutils, GDB, which are widespread uh, uh, among different binary analysis tools. And the impact we had when, once we released the camera-ready version of our, of our paper and the, the tool itself was amazing. So we, we got uh, lots of people tweeted about it and um, uh, some guys actually took our tool and tried it out and tested it, and tested it against, the state, against the state of the art on uh, Perl and Erlang and wrote up blog posts about it and uh, put it up on Hacker News and it was actually featured on Hacker News for a few hours as a top ranked item. So uh, just a small excerpt from, from the comments about this uh, on Hacker News. That's, that's uh, something which is much more valuable to a security researcher um, than a best paper award say. So, so, um, so you can have some practical impact if you do, if you do work on fuzzing. Okay, let's take, uh, take a step back and look at the main techniques in automated vulnerability detection. So on the one hand, you have something called black box fuzzing, which is a, like a random approach um, where you essentially uh, generate random inputs for a program and, and see whether it crashes. It's extremely fast because there's no program analysis. You can think of uh, the order of uh, 500 to 5,000 executions per second. And there's this other thing called white box fuzzing. It's a more systematic approach. The thing here is that you want to exercise different paths in your program and, uh, and uh, you're able to reach deep vulnerabilities um, in, in the program. You can cover as much code as, as possible. There is something called symbolic execution-based uh, white box fuzzing, which uh, enumerates the paths in the program. You generate inputs exercising different paths. But, uh, but it requires heavy machinery. You have to do program analysis. Um, so black box fuzzing, on, on the one hand, is very efficient. There, you can have um, so many executions per second. It's scalable because there's no program analysis. As the program grows, uh, the technique doesn't get slower. Uh, you don't need to do any modeling because, for instance, you don't need to lift the control flow graph or you don't need to model the memory or SMT theories, which are all needed, for instance, in symbolic execution-based white box fuzzing, and it, you can easily parallelize it. Now, white box fuzzing, one of the benefits is really that you can expose vulnerabilities which, uh, which are deep in the code, uh, which may be one of the problems of black box fuzzing. Often it's, it is said that black box fuzzing exposes shallow vulnerabilities. Right, F fun fact, uh, m most vulnerabilities are found by fuzzers which do not use any program analysis, which is the left-hand side, black box fuzzing. <clears throat> uh, so actual fact, 
even the most effective technique, uh, like similar execution-based white box fuzzing, is less efficient than black box fuzzing if generating a test takes relatively too long. So we actually quantify this. This is not in the paper. This is another paper, but it's a fun thing to say. So coverage-based gray box fuzzing is in between of, uh, as the name already says, in between of black box fuzzing and white box fuzzing. You get path exploration, which is the benefit of, uh, of white box fuzzing, and you don't, do not require program analysis, which gives you the scalability and the efficiency of, of black box fuzzing. So how does it work? Yeah. Fuzzing, what you do is you, get a f you start with a file. Then you do random things to a file. You flip some bits. You substitute certain values with boundary values. You add or subtract some numbers. You delete some blocks from that file, or you clone some parts from the file. So you modify that file. And we call the, the, the new files we generate by modifying this file the, the fuzz of the seed. So that's what happens. Um, so now coverage-based gray box fuzzing is um, you only retain the generated inputs, the fuzz which exercise new and interesting paths. And what, it, what, it, what is done under the hood is the program is inter instrumented such that for each input you execute, you get a path ID, you get a certain ID. So if you execute two inputs and they get the same path ID, you can throw one away. <coughs> uh, so Craybox just means uh, no program analysis, uh, only instrumentation. So once you have uh, um, uh, have this um, uh, essentially, essentially retained those test cases, you choose the next test case. What, what AFL does is it, it maintains a certain queue where each of the new seeds it finds will be added to the queue, and, and then it just takes the next input in this queue. And once it reaches the end of the queue, you just start from the beginning, so it's actually a circular queue. Then again, you go ahead and fuzz it. Uh, generate a lot more files, and retain, retain only those that exercise new and interesting paths. And there you go. This is a, this is a Markov chain. Um, it's actually a fancy name for a very simple concept. So uh, a Mark the Markov chain here describes the probability pij that fuzzing the input that exercises path i generates an input exercising path j. Now, what one interesting thing about uh, this Markov chain in particular uh, is that um, it has a stationary distribution. So independent of, of where you start in that uh, Markov chain, you, will, uh, you follow these transitions from states to states according to these transition probabilities, you will end up in a certain state with a certain probability. And this probability is giving the stationary distribution of the Markov chain, essentially. So you, you could think that there are certain, uh, starting from fuzzing one test case and you keep on fuzzing, uh, adding to the queue, that you will uh, visit a state in this Markov chain more often after a sequence of this fuzzing steps. And we call this the high density region of the stationary distribution of the Markov chain. Um, it, there's also, of course, the other side is some of the uh, test cases which we, uh, which are, or states which are visited in the Markov chain will be visited with less probability, and therefore, therefore uh, these states exist in a low density region of the stationary distribution of the Markov chain. So it will become more clear later on. So what we also do is, so we extend this model, Markov chain model, by adding uh, uh, energy to each of the states. So energy is a local property which is local to each state, uh, unlike in simulated and leaning where temperature is a global property. So what does it mean? Uh, so each state has an energy. If it has a high energy, we, we, uh, we generate a lot of fuzz from that state. And if, ha if it has a low energy, we generate uh, not a lot of fuzz. We generate only a few test cases by fuzzing this test case. What assigns the energy will be called a power schedule. And the power schedule uh, is one of the contributions in our, in our paper. So one example, you have uh, a seed file which exercises the path i, and with probability 1 over 100, 
you will exercise, you will discover a new seed exercising a path J, which has not been exercised before. So um, the question here is, how much fuss do we need to generate in order to discover this new path? Well, that's the same as asking, what is the minimum energy which is required to expect the discovery of that new path? Well, in this example, it's very simple because we know PIJ, we just generate 100 test cases. Of course, in reality, we don't know PIJ, and we do not even maintain this in our, in our uh, extension. Um, so now we use this Markov chain model to discover, uh, to explain the challenges of coverage-based uh, gray box fuzzing. So one of the challenges is that uh, AFL, as a representative of uh, coverage-based gray box fuzzing, um, has a power schedule, so it assigns energy, that is constant in the number of times it is being ch chosen from the input Q. Uh, okay, what does it mean? Let's say we have, uh, th again, the same example. We don't know PIJ. Uh, what AFL does, it assigns hi uh, high energy. Let's say it generates 80,000 test cases from that seed. So if it happens that the probability to discover J is only 1 over 100, this is way too much energy, way too many test cases being generated. Um, on the other hand, if the probability would be 1 over 100,000, uh, 80,000 uh, test cases would not be sufficient. So what we suggest is um, an exponential schedule. So uh, exponential in the number of times you choose it from the queue. So let's say you choose it from the queue the first time. You only generate one test case. You choose it from the queue the next time, so you pu put it back to the queue, you fuzz some other seeds, it, and once you reach uh, that queue again, you, fuzz it, you generate two test cases. Um, so you put it back to the queue and so on. So it, it, it increases exponentially, so 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. And in only a few iterations, you've, uh, you've generated only a minimal number of test cases to discover this path using this, uh, by, by you essentially exponentially approaching the minimum energy required to discover this. So earlier we saw that uh, AFL assigns 80,000, uh, generates 80,000 test cases, which is about 7, 79,873 more test cases than if, we've, if we'd follow this, uh, this schedule. And that energy which AFL wastes is probably better invested in fuzzing other seeds. Um, a second problem, a second challenge is that AFL's power schedule assigns high energy. Okay, so let's say uh, we have a valid PDF file. We want to fuzz Acrobat Reader, right? Um, we can say that, um, so in, in the Markov chain terminology, we say that, uh, that uh, the state represented by this seed is in a low density region of the stationary distribution. In other words, uh, we, it exercises a low frequency path. So it's, it's very unlikely that you generate uh, a valid PDF file from any file. Okay. So we assign high energy. That's what AFL does. It's good because it's very likely that generating a valid PDF file from another valid PDF file, uh, the likelihood is high. Right? So we generate a few files. We retain only the interesting ones. Let's say that one of those files is, invalid, is an invalid PDF file. And we can say that uh, lots of generated files will be uh, invalid PDF files. So it, it's actually in a high density region of the stationary distribution of the Markov chain or exercising a high frequency path. OK, so we go on fuzzing. If we fuzz a bit. Um, and then at some point, we'll, uh, we'll uh, reach that seed which exercises um, a high frequency uh, path. Now, ag again, we invest 80,000, uh, fast, fast this seed 80,000 times. Um, it's quite intuitive that uh, fuzzing an invalid file won't give you another valid PDF file. While, while it was intuitive to fuzz a valid PDF file and get another valid PDF file. Right. So always assigning high energy is not very good. Mm -hmm. 
So we, uh, to be a bit more specific, we conducted some experiments, and we were looking at, uh, on the, on the x-axis, uh, you see uh, path index, um, which is uh, one index means another. So if there are different indexes, these are different paths. And uh, on the y-axis, you see the number of fuzz uh, exercising these paths. And what, what we found in this experiment is that half of the fuzz, which is generated in this whole fuzzing uh, uh, campaign, is exercising three paths. So, uh, so most, most fuzz which is generated exercises uh, the same few paths, so-called high-frequency paths. So how our, our key insight is that we want to address this tendency to exercise these high-frequency paths and instead focus most of the energy in exercising low-frequency paths. So uh, AFL fast power schedule or AFL fast being our tool, uh, assigns energy that is inversely, inversely proportional to the density of the stationary distribution. Uh, in other words, it assigns low energy to high frequency paths and assigns high energy to low frequency paths. And we approximate the distribution of this density of the stationary di distribution by counting the number of fuzz exercising that, that, uh, that input, exercising the path I. Okay, so just a, like a very small summary, um, the challenges of coverage-based grab box fuzzing are that AFL spends too much energy in high frequency, uh, in high density domains. And you should probably spend more energy in, uh, in the low density domains. And we also suggest to spend minimum energy required to discover a new state. So, uh, so what assigns energy is called a power schedule. Um, so let's go through a bit of the, of the math here. Um, what AFL does, it, uh, as I said, it's assigning a constant energy. Um, constant in the number of times it's been chosen from the input, Q. Um, AFL has a certain judgment of how often it should fuzz this seed, and uh, this is captured in al alpha i. So what it does is, if a, test, if a seed is uh, smaller and executes very fast, you can generate a lot more test cases from this. Uh, or if, it, if the seed is discovered only very late in the fussing campaign, you'll probably also want to fuss fusses a lot more. So this is what AFL does. Now, we, uh, one of our uh, power schedules is called cutoff exponential power schedule. It's actually two components. What you want to do is you want to assign no energy to high frequency paths. And what it means is we take the number of fuss exercising path I, Fi, and, uh, and if it is greater than the average mu, then assign no energy. Otherwise, if it's a, essentially if it's a low frequency path, you take the judgment of AFL, uh, made, make it small, alpha i, divided by beta in order to make it smaller, beta being just a constant, and multiply it by an exponential function, two to the power of si, where si is the number of times you choose it from the q. This is the cutoff exponential, and we just extended this, this a little bit. Instead of spending no energy on states and high density regions, we spend energy proportional to the density of the uh, stage region. So instead of uh, having this fi l uh, less than the average, you have you just divide by fi. These are the power schedules. We also have search strategies. Search strategies decide in which order uh, you want to choose the seeds from the queue. If what AFL does, as I said several times, it just takes the next in the queue, and it, re it returns to the beginning of the queue once it reached the end. What we say is you probably want to fuzz those most progressive uh, seeds first, and uh, so we pri prioritize seeds which exercise lower frequency paths and also have been chosen less often. But generally, in each cycle, we choose each seed once. So you could say that AFL and AFL fast choose the same files in one cycle, but just in a different order. So we did some experiments uh, on binutils. Binutils is a binary analysis uh, tool. It's very interesting to study binutils because uh, when, we, when you start fuzzing with an empty file, which we did, you have to generate uh, binary programs which are consumed by these binary analysis files in order to trigger bugs or vulnerabilities. And we found vulnerabilities in GDB, Wargrind, GCOF, and many other uh, libbfd-based tools. Um, the, uh, so we found it in, a, in this library called libbfd, in particular in the Deem Langler, and, uh, but it's so widespread in binary analysis tools that the vulnerability exists uh, 
quite, quite, quite everywhere. Um, so what you do is, um, an attacker might modify a binary such that it becomes malicious up in analysis. Let's say you implement a virus scanner and um, this virus, virus scanner happens to use the libbfd uh, library. Um, during scanning for viruses, you execute the virus. I mean, uh, this is quite, uh, quite interesting. Um, and also, let's say you want to look at a, a binary file in order to understand what it does. You want to reverse engineer it. During reverse engineering, you actually uh, trigger the malicious uh, uh, code. So we found nine uh, vulnerabilities, um, which we also use for our evaluation. And we also found three bugs, uh, which, we, which are not exploitable. So let's look at the power schedules. And specifically, we look at the number of unique crashes. Unique crash is just a, a crash which exercises uh, a different path. So you have two crashing files exercising the same path. It's not a unique crash. Right. So this is that axis, and the other axis is 24 hours. Uh, the, uh, the upper solid bar is an exponential schedule, which we call AFL fast, and uh, which is directly followed by the cutoff exponential. Um, and the worst performing is AFL, which is almost an order of magnitude less, uh, produces an order of magnitude less crashes than, uh, than uh, most of our other schedules. Um, so exponential performs best. So we also um, looked at these uh, some six tools in Binutils. In three tools, we did neither AFL nor AFL fast found a, found a crash um, with the settings we had. Uh, but for two of the tools, um, as you can see, this is an exponential scale on the y-axis. Uh, um, AFL fast being the upper solid bar again uh, finds an almost an order of magnitude uh, more crashes for two to, for two tools and. For, for one tool, it's the only one, AFL fast is the only one finding any unique crashes in uh, six hours. Okay, then we look at time to exposure. This is a measure of efficiency and vulnerability detection research. Uh, time to exposure means how long does it take from starting the tool to finding the first crashing input that exposes this vulnerability. Now, in order to know which vulnerability is exposed by a crashing uh, input, we patched each of the vulnerabilities. We generated a patched version for each of the vulnerabilities and executed the crashing input on these patches. Um, if it doesn't fail anymore, it is considered uh, to be exposing that vulnerability. And if it's the first such test case, uh, well, we take it for, uh, as, as the time, uh, time stamp for time to export it. Um, okay, so this is a bit of, uh, this is a plot, with, uh, which is a box plot and a, uh, overlay, a jitter, jitter plot overlay uh, for the different vulnerabilities. On the left-hand side of each vulnerability, you see uh, AFL fast. On the right-hand side, you see AFL. Each dot means that time, uh, is a time to exposure for one run. And what we can see, for instance, in the, in the left, uh, in the upper left uh, um, vulnerability is that AFL fast in only two runs out of eight, it's the only one finding, exposing this vulnerability. While AFL in 24 hours, none of the, eight, uh, none of the 10 runs will expose, uh, expose this vulnerability. And for the other uh, vulnerabilities, many of the other vulnerabilities, you can easily see that there's a, a, a difference in, 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 in the time. So specifically, uh, AFL fast exposes six of the CVEs seven times faster, and three of the CV CVEs uh, are only exposed by, by our tool. Of course, we think that if, L, if AFL, uh, AFL is given more time, you, you'll be able to discover, uh, AFL will also be able to discover these CVEs. So there's an independent evaluation also. So we took, uh, so as it happened, Dawn Song was visiting our team in, in Singapore, and uh, she, uh, she also leads this effort uh, in the Darber Cyberground Challenge. She was preparing for the finals of the Darber Cyberground Challenge and, and was interested in our tool. I gave a similar talk and she said, yeah, let's go ahead and try it out. So she, she went and looked at the benchmark um, binaries of the Darber Cyberground Challenge and found that our tool is, so probably not she, but uh, one of her students, uh, that um, IFL fast is 19 times faster in terms of time to exposure. <coughs> also, they then, uh, uh, of course, uh, they only placed fifth in general, but in terms of vulnerability detection, they placed second, and perhaps in part because of our, uh, our implementation. 
Of course, they had other uh, vulnerability detection uh, techniques uh, involved. So in summary, um, what I showed you is the benefits of coverage-based gray box fuzzing as it is placed between uh, black box fuzzing, which is very efficient, and white box fuzzing, which is very effective. I have also shown that you can model coverage-based gray box fuzzing as a Markov chain, and you can assign energy to certain states. And then we use this Markov chain model to, e to explain challenges, uh, the challenges of existing coverage-based gray box fuzzers and how to address these challenges. Then I explained a few power schedules and a, a few uh, search strategies, and I also, we all, I also presented an evaluation of our, uh, of our tool. So thank you very much. That's all for my, for my side. Are there any questions? State your name and affiliation.